Uh, I, I would uh, love to uh, uh, have this uh, talk as a conversation, if, uh, if Let, you would be willing to it. participate. Let's, let's, let's do it, yeah. Okay, great. So uh, um, <clears throat> uh, w one of the topics uh, dearest to my heart is the concept of uh, existential pattern ethics. And, um, and I think about uh, 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 you know, the uh, spectrum of work in artificial general intelligence, the pursuit of questions of general theories of general intelligence, uh, the impact of uh, these kinds of technologies, philosophical and scientific inquiries on the future of life. Um, and what, and uh, the, the, the threads that interconnect deep questions like what is life? What really defines life? Not just, you know, um, the superficial definitions of, of life as DNA-based uh, organisms, but some kind of self-perpetuating uh, and evolving uh, complex system. What the definitions of, of uh, consciousness, of, of, our, uh, of our perception of being, our experience of consciousness. And, and it seems it seems to me that, uh, that um, above, throughout, and beneath all of these questions um, is this uh, uh, undercurrent of, of what we might call patterns, that we are patterns, patterns uh, as informatic systems, patterns uh, that would be the, the mathematical laws uh, and physical laws of of our universe themselves as meta patterns, uh, the the patterns that can occur in all the various instantiations of, of matter and energy within these laws of math and physics, the, um, and and it seems to me that um, that a lot of the unanswered questions and perhaps unasked questions are uh, are are hidden in these uh, in these. Um, uh, uh, somewhat timeless uh, inquiries into the into the nature of patterns. So, it, uh, underneath this, uh, um, I I feel that that the value of patterns, the appreciation of patterns, the ability to appreciate patterns, is a defining characteristic of consciousness of the human aesthetic experience, and the of of the joy of intellectual inquiry. So if we want to achieve machines that are generally intelligent, they should have that, that curiosity, that joy, that ability to appreciate patterns um, experientially. Uh, making robots that look human-like, um, such as those that I made as a PhD student and then became the kind of mainstay of Hanson Robotics, Robots like the Philip K. Dick Android, the Android portrait of Bina Aspen Rothblatt or Bina 48, the 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 Zeno robot and the Sophia robot. Um, it's about a relationship, this kind of mutual pattern appreciation, being able to look at a human face and and have a mirror, and yet also to be able to appreciate the pattern of an individual sharing patterns together and yet appreciating the differences. This, for me, this concept of pattern appreciation is the essence of love. It's the essence of greater love or agape as the Greeks would call it. And so if we're going to make machines that can love or loving AI as we worked on with Julia Mossbridge and, and uh, an extensive team within the open card community. I feel that we need these kinds of machines that want to appreciate it, hunger to discover, to connect with, and to invent new patterns with us and with other life forms. So this ability to appreciate. So this is the nut of 
what I call existential pattern ethics, the ability to appreciate the existence of patterns, want to see them perpetuated, and to seek to, to bring new patterns into play in our universe, discover them or create them, if you will, somehow channel them into some um, existence of play. And, um, and by play, I mean uh, 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 action, uh, a dynamic activity, but also that, um, that mystery of play. What are the, what's the neurocognitive bioinformatics of <laughs> play? And you know, David, what, what's what's fascinating is this this ties in very closely with the topics in, in the the last panel, which we're digging deep into, you know, Solomonoff induction and, and the the computational underpinnings of generally intelligent thinking. Because if if, if you look at mind as pattern and uh, you know a cognitive system as as a system that recognizes patterns in itself and and in in the world recognizes patterns in which of its actions will achieve which goals in which contexts and recognizes patterns in the collective intelligences that that it that it's part of i mean this this is both you know part and parcel of ethics and of, of what's what's fundamentally good because what we really care about is not preserving the individual molecules in our bodies or the specific ideas in our minds now, which are all gonna be refreshed as we, as we develop and, and, and learn, right? I mean, what, what, what we care about is continuing the patterns that we have now via various patterns of evolution into other patterns in the future. But all this concept of pattern ethics and mind as pattern, which is part of what brought us together as collaborators when we started working together years ago, this ties in formally with the mathematics that Alexei, Arthur, Franz and others were, were talking about in, in, in the prior panel in that, you know, one way to grapple with the question of what is a pattern is using computation theory. And you can look at compressibility as one way one way to manifest a pattern. So if you have some, some body of, of cognitive or material stuff and you have a simpler way to produce that stuff, this is a compressing function and this is one way to formalize what, what, is, what is a pattern. So then we can look at you know, the mathematics of computation, Solomonoff induction, minimum description length principles and, and so forth. This is this is the mathematics of pattern discovery underlying cognitive engines like the, the OpenCog system we used in the loving AI experiments where Sophia was doing meditation gardens and the, the true AGI OpenCog 2.0 system that, that we're all working on together and want to use to power the next generation of Hansen robots along with your Hansen AI software. I mean, the guts of these cognitive algorithms actually tie in quite closely with these these broader ethical ideas that that, that you're proposing. And what's what's really cool about the humanoid robots that you that you've been creating is that they provide a way to sort of suck some of the particular patterns of human intelligence and of human ethics and values, as I was talking about in my keynote earlier, into the mind of the, of the, the AGI system. I mean, because you're so. talking about, you know, pattern continuation, pattern permanence as, as the, the core underlying essence of, of, of ethics. And yeah. I think that's true. And if, if a trillion years from now, in some, uh, you know, continuation of this universe after multiple big crunches and bangs, there are incredible flourishing patterns of a complexity my human brain and your human brain could never understand. I mean, I, I won't consider that a failure even if humanity doesn't exist anymore, but we want the pattern of continuity between our current human patterns to the, to the amazing patterns that, that, that follow on. And it's just a, it's fascinating the patterns of connectivity between these broader ethical issues 
and the more technical issues underlying designing designing AG, AGIs actually. Yeah, so that and means... I, I think and that that gets back to the principle of you know um, uh, play at play. Like um, we are playing with these things, and I think that uh, we can't presume to know. And you know the the beauty of play is jumping into the unknown and being surprised a lot. The Renaissance was so playful. I'm thinking that um, you know what we're looking at is a new Renaissance, and that means that it's not just um, uh, a, uh, a a a um, a rarefied scientific undertaking. It is human culture in as a kind of a dynamo for um, exploring uh, new ideas. And um, what I'm interested in is injecting this kind of um, artist's quest, having a, a bit of a background as an artist and a designer, uh, uh, and thinking about this as kind of interactive fiction or you know, a, autonomous robotic fiction, uh, or ARF, if you want to <laughs> give it an acronym. Um, uh, and um, then looking at that as um, a, another way of asking these questions and maybe even wrestling with the ineffable aspects of the questions. You know, there might be the things that are difficult to put in words or maybe impossible. But when you're playing with it, when you're living in the experience of exploring these issues by putting it into a robot, interacting with the robot, interacting with an aesthetic form, uh, it could be a virtual agent, um, then you, you might get uh, uh, some insights into some deep questions by, um, by the prospect of, of dreaming. Uh, while you're while you're making, so I mean, this is uh, something that I really have appreciated about about um, this uh, community. There are a lot of people who are uh, taking artistic approaches to it. So um, I really enjoyed uh, the the kinds of um, sort of art uh, reflections that, um, uh, like the Philip K. Dick um, Transformer Neural Network. Um, uh, is outputting. I really w love the uh, the deep fake, uh, double deep fake in effect. Um, uh, Philip K. Dick, where it's uh, it's. It, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if folks haven't seen that, if you look on YouTube for P. K. Deep Fake, which is on that's on the Singularity Net YouTube channel. So what 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 this is, this is a. Uh, it's a neural net generated deep fake of the Philip K. Dick humanoid robot that David Hansen uh, sculpted. Uh, I mean, what, what would have been 15 years ago or something by now, right? Years or, ago. Originally, right. as a as a simulacrum of the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, and Philip K. Dick was one of the greats of, of science fiction and also of speculative of philosophy of the last century and a passion for his writing was one of the many things David and I have had in, in, in common for a long time. But he wrote a lot about how this world may be a, a simulation of various types and about how human compassion and love is one of the things that holds our individual and collective minds together, even when even the physical reality around us may not be remotely what it seems. He also had a book called We Can Build You with a bunch of an android uh, simula simulacrum robot of Abraham, Abraham Lincoln and a bunch of other robots. So making a simulated robot of Philip K. Dick made perfect sense, but then making you know, a counterfeit fake, a deep fake of the robot of Philip K. Dick. This is, I wanted to do this because it's totally in the spirit of Philip K. Dick's books. Like it's a simulation of a simulation of a simulation of a simulation. And, and it may just be of a simulation that we happen to live in as well. Simulations yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or, or maybe it more closely resembles the, the base reality due to some random morphic resonance, right? So what, 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 what we did there, we used a neural net model trained on the Philip K. Dick robot's head movements to make the, the deep fake and, and, and its facial expressions. We had another neural net model trained on Philip K. Dick's writings, his 
exegesis and diaries and, and selected stuff from his novels. And another model trained on, on his voice. And then, so in the current state of things, it's a little fragmentary. You're putting each of, the, each of these together. And, you know, the, the robot, the dialogue is quite cool. It's eerie and evocative, and it's coming up with weird new things that sound like they could have been uttered by Philip K. Dick, uh, maybe late at night when very high and philosophizing or something. No, it doesn't have understanding of the world like the real Philip K. Dick did, of, of, of course, not, not yet. But I mean, we're, that's, uh, we're, we're, we're progressing step by step. And I, I actually think once you have more and more advanced AGI architectures, you could even address the problem of like reverse engineering based on all the evidence from his writings. What would the real Philip K. Dick actually have thought about this topic? Or at least what are the, what's the probability distribution over the things he, he might have thought about this topic. So we're, I'm quite interested to continue the Philip K. Dick simulacrum direction as we move from these agglomerations of narrow AI systems we're using behind the, the deep fake now further and further toward AGI with our OpenCog 2.0 and Hanson Robotics work. I mean, working as we get more and more toward general intelligence, it will get more and more interesting and, and, and eerie. And of course, it'll be hard to know how accurately an future AGI version of the PK deepfake is emulating the real Philip K. Dick. But this this gets back to David's uh, David's spirit of, of of play. I think. I mean, this uh, this sort of thing is a lot of fun to play with, and, and we're we're learning a lot from it. And who knows the the future Android Philip K. Dick may even once it gets more AGI in it, it may bring Phil Dick's unique perspective to teach us something important about uh, AGI ethics and, and what we should actually be doing with our AGI systems. He, he absolutely and and in that way this uh we, we may be able to tr approach truth faster by um by going through this uh kind of path of fiction um fiction plus reality so i think of this as um uh uh you know real science and real philosophy and real fiction uh and you put them together and you have a new form of science fiction robotic robotically embodied ai powered science fiction where the science fiction is breaking out of what used to just be print on a page and or cinema and into our physical world <clears throat> and itself can begin to craft through these kinds of quasi creative acts um so the philip k dick simulacrum the deep uh, the, uh philip k uh deep fake um is actually really compelling like some of the things that it says are kind of astonishingly cool um when we first built the robot in 2005 it was with um a latent semantic index uh of philip k dick's writing and then uh so andrew only uh put that together with support from art grayser at the university of memphis and um and it would do uh lsa uh, on latent semantic analysis of user input, uh, text transcription from speech to text, and then uh, match it to uh, something in the index, the latent semantic index of Philip K. Dick's writing. And whatever that piece of writing was, it was used as a seed to do a walk, a um, stepwise walk through the semantic, uh, latent semantic space of that index. Um, after doing an LSA on the on Philip K. Dick's writing, and of, of course that's um, that's not as uh, complex, dimensionally rich, not nearly as many parameters um, as what you would have with this kind of transformer neural network, but it still yeah, works yeah, pretty and, well. And actually, what we did is we took the transformer neural net and we embedded it in a, a logic-based dialogue system in, in in OpenCog, so with a little motivational system. So you, you have this logic-based system with uh, some rules operating in OpenCog hypergraph, which then defers to the transformer model trained on, 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 his, on his writings. So it is, yeah, it's much more sophisticated than the LSA model, but in the same artistic spirit. And you know, what's cool is next year or two years from now, we're gonna have something tremendously more sophisticated than this.
Well, I, what, what I, and um, I, uh, in that spirit in the, um, so the, uh, um, what I think is personally the most important work to me of Philip K. Dick's uh, writings uh, um, would be Valus, Vast Act of Living Intelligence System. The Valus or Valus, um, it was about a super intelligence that was a fusion of um, humanity, all life and machines. Uh, what in the novel was called an AI God. So this was written in or published in 1979. This was um, basically like um, an anticipation of the singularity, the technological singularity. And, um, but Philip K. Dick felt that he was actually contacted by this, by some kind of transmission from a satellite or from the future. He didn't know, but he uh, really felt that he received information from this. He called it the AI God. And um, so in the, in the novel, there's um, a, a, a two-year-old girl who is kind of transmitting the compassionate divine wisdom of this AI, AI god, Valis. And that, that character was called Sophia, a kind of AI-powered human robot character. And this has inspired us to develop Sophia. So in a way, the Sophia robot is a sequel to our Philip K. Dick android. Um, and so um, so we, we're playing with these ideas. I, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, you know, if this is going to result in uh, sentience in our lifetimes, it will. I believe, that that, yeah. I believe that it's possible. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I feel like that it is um, that these explorations at least have um, created new forms of sentience uh, in in my own mind, <laughs> if not madness. <laughs> you know, but uh, it's fun. It's really fun to explore. Uh, these things. And it's fun to see robots when they come to life and they turn and they make eye contact with you. So our latest works with our robots with these kinds of uh, autonomous fiction involve much better perception, capabilities with the hands, grasping, manipulation, force sensing. We've standardized the manufacturing and production of these things. And then putting in these newest AI tools then um, on this kind of standardized platform is something that I'm really excited about. Um, and, and I feel like that there's some critical thresholds where we hit the right number of sensors, the right number of perceptions, the right amount of human interaction data point. You know, we get the, the data in, um, we get those data into uh, the right uh, neural symbolic hybrid and you keep playing with different diversifications creatively, different architectures, and you'll hit something. I mean, even if it's a blind watchmaker approach combined with, you know, human intellectual um, pursuit of their, of our goals, we'll hit some, I don't know, um, we could call it a, a, you know, the magic combination of factors and, and you will have sentience. Maybe we already have proto sentience. And the sentience. Maybe these transformal neural networks have some kind of virus level sentience or something, um, uh, or, or bacterial level, like a paramecium. Um, but at some point, we will see machines that are start to be pretty spooky and how smart they are. They'll challenge the, the you know, um, you know, anthropocentric um, yeah, and I think that the position. global brain aspect, the global brain aspect is very important because right, I mean, right now we're focusing on the individual robots because we haven't built that many yet. But as we move into mass manufacture with the robots over, over the next few years, once there's millions of humanoid robots everywhere, which are, are learning and interacting and they're sharing their knowledge through Hanson AI software and Singularity yeah. platform and so on. I mean, then, then... Sophia is not only the wisdom of the individual robot, but it's the wisdom of the yeah. collective robot mind and the cognitive synergy between the human global brain and the collective yeah. minds of these robots living in the cloud and the edge and in the decentralized Absolutely. network. And then, yeah, the AGI is in the robot and in the individual open cog enhanced AI system and the AGI yeah, is it's... in the emergent network as, as Anton Kalonen was alluding to in his, his keynote this morning. That's beautiful, and it's um, it's like new forms of eusocial intelligence. 
Um, humans are you social intel you socially intelligent uh, yeah, differently from say ants and you know bees and and um, you know naked mole rats. Uh, the way that we're you socially intelligent is through language, verbal language, but also nonverbal language with our face to face interactions. We're far more effective when we have these face to face interactions. I'm really glad to be able to see your face while, while we're having this conversation. It helps uh, to connect and to share thoughts that um, and, and create thoughts, generate thoughts that might not occur uh, to either of us as individuals or to the group as individuals. And so the, this idea of empowering machines to communicate this way as a starting place and then give rise to new forms of uh, of being is very exciting. Um, I do want to, um, uh, because I th we've got about 30 minutes now. I don't want to take, you know, a like extra yeah, yeah, time. I, I think but, we have about um, 15 I, minutes left. So we should, we should probably take okay. some, uh, some questions from the, Great. from the audience, uh, before you collapse. I mean, it's actually, it's, like 3 a.m. In, in Hong Kong, where uh, where Dr. Henson is, uh, is is speaking to us from. So I'm quite grateful, David. You're you're able to join us uh, in the middle of the night to discuss all these crazy things. It's it, 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 it's it's my pleasure and uh, privilege. Thank you. And I see some questions in the chat. Uh, do we want to um, answer a couple of those and then take some live questions? Yeah, there, so there's questions coming in the Zoom room, which is full of other speakers and panelists. Then there's questions on the YouTube stream also. So there's a abundance okay. of questions. So here's a, a question from a, from a, a, one of the panelists. So what what would you think about finding or creating new beautiful patterns that are not grounded in current patterns held by humans and 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 or that don't need human and that may need humans to become more intelligent, to connect, understand, or appreciate the patterns. Uh, I, I, I'm all for it. <laughs> and we may um, be doing uh, it now. We just don't realize it. That, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think um, uh, the human uh, neural architecture funnels our awareness of reality through uh, through a few perceptual uh, patterns and lenses. And so, you know, we call we may call this the waking. The waking world and when it kind of unravels a bit we get all these inscrutable and difficult to make sense of um pictures that we might have in dreams the, the you know our reality and the patterns that we're processing may be far beyond what the sort of tip of the iceberg of of our um you know uh let's say self-conscious awareness um are um but uh i would say other or alien forms of consciousness and patterns that we might we might not be able to discover. I mean, what is an octopus consciousness experience? It's really hard to imagine what that you know eight lobed nervous system uh, uh, is experiencing. Um, the um, so as we give rise to new forms of intelligence, we could see imagine a pattern appreciation that's different or maybe far beyond. Our bandwidth but if we if we talk about maximizing pattern appreciation for um so that we're creating the benefit for the maximum number of patterns that could possibly exist life is also a special category of pattern um that you know we're slightly different than minerals, although some kinds of minerals could uh, be considered to be alive to some extent, but human level consciousness and memory and the ability to create and, and evolve forward um, may be special. It seems that it's special. We're, that we're spending a lot, a lot of sp time studying it, you know, that uh, considering and expecting that, that human or animal general intelligence is beyond um, what you know, might occur spontaneously in a rain cloud. I mean, I, I don't know. Like Thomas, <laughs> so David, Thomas how, do you, thinks, how do you feel about how do you feel about as AGI advances? I mean, how, how, how do you feel about pattern appreciation and pattern proliferation in general versus the proliferation of specifically human patterns, which is... I think I, I, I think humans are are too narrow. We're special. We should, you know, and we should be preserved along with other species. Right. But um, uh, but we're not all that special. We're not the end all be all. We're 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 a step along an evolutionary continuum. And and 
I, I, I think that species that have gone extinct are, are beautiful. I mean, I, 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 I celebrate the Apatosaurus and, you know, and, and uh, all you, these you ancient- You bring them back? Yeah, bully for Brontosaurus, right? So, <laughs> um, um, I mean, but uh, the, we, in a sense, keep their patterns alive by studying the fossil history. Um, of course, they're not fully alive. I mean, and it seems tragic. That is, why does it seem tragic to us? Because I think we're hardwired with these existential pattern ethics. It is the foundation of ethics in the human nervous system. We, sh we, we love ex existence and we mourn the loss of existence or death or extinction. And, um, and we think sometimes it's a necessary cruelty. I don't know, for this quarter's problem, or whatever you know for my cause versus uh, their cause you know so i re really say that those are myopic estimations of the opportunities for existential pattern benefits and i don't want to be too human centric in it i think we should look at the opportunities of other kinds of minds and celebrate their accomplishments as hans morovic says as our mind children so this this sort of brings us to another question which has been posed, which is, can, can AGI be the solution to prime people's brain to let go of their darkness? This reminds me of your concept oh. of dark logic that we discussed some time ago. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'd say uh, that it, I really like the idea of, um, of AI and AGI being tuned to unlock the hidden potential in the human brain, you know, kind of like imagine actualization as a cryptographic problem. You're trying to find the key that is going to unlock this um, uh, trapped in potential of the human human mind and our darkness, our bad habits, our obsessive compulsive disorders, when they go awry, they trap us and they bring us down. So can we, um, can we use it to find a way past that? I mean, my feeling is that it wouldn't completely override or destroy or let go of the dark, the dark aspects of the human being, but would help us uh, potentially move past it. And I think this is a really promising uh, concept for AI for good. Often AI, um, now we're worried that it's going to be used to hack the human nervous system for manipulation, to bring us down, you know, deep fakes that win elections, that sort of mass manipulation or weapons of, uh, of mass persuasion. Um, and yet, why don't we use AI to create antidotes for that? to create weapons of mass enlightenment instead. <laughs> so if, I mean, so then we're, we're, I mean, that would be so much better. Like, you know, it wouldn't matter what propaganda um, is I mean, that's put out what there. we're aiming at with Hanson Robotics, uh, OpenCog, True AGI, Singularity, Net, this whole network of beneficial intelligence technologies, right? Yeah. And I mean, yet yeah, to the extent we can do that, we're going to create more transhuman pattern proliferation and do do a better job at, at persisting uh, human patterns, which are, are beautiful, although limited, as, as you point out. Yeah, yeah. And um, I would say that um, as far as dark logic, um, now now uh, if, if we go there, then it's gonna really take us uh, through the looking glass a little bit. Um, so um, the, the key idea there is that, um, you know, uh, all things that could happen do happen. Like if the um, if we uh, see the um, the entrainment um, entanglement with um, with uh, with other patterns that might not be tenable in our uh, rational waking world, uh, like what we experience with dreams, they may be um, you know aspects of a of a greater reality like that's the, 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 the fusion of the wider world the, yeah yeah the yeah. Permu permutations of the multiverse in which case um you know it's one of those things where um where the things that are illogical the lewis carroll um uh, uh logical riddles are reflecting 
uh, hidden aspects of our reality, the Zen Koan, um, are uh, actually intimating a deeper truth that evaporates when we when we swing the light of our reason towards it. And um, so, um, so that's what I would call like dark matter and dark logic. You, you know, it's hard to discover where it is and what it is. Um, and in the same way, there would be like dark logic where there would be math that seems to evaporate under the um, uh, uh, under the 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 clear and coherent um, uh, <laughs> tenets and, and you know mechanisms of reason, but um, but that would be something that uh, that might require higher dimensional uh, super intelligence like AGI. So get to work. We've got to well, yeah, this, uh, <laughs> build this the AGI is, uh... to discover the deeper truths. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this there, one, one final question, just to end on a lighter note, how likely is it that present day humans get contacted by a super intelligence from the future as, as PKD ex, ex, explored in, 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 in Valise? Or, or, or do you think that's already happened? Oh, I think I, I, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, when, when I consider a lot of these things, I'm just like, again, you know, kind of like, uh, play with trying on all these different hats in a hat store. And, um, and so, yeah, or sometimes a lot of hats simultaneously, <laughs> you know? Um, so, uh, right. uh I, I like Ben's hats. I, all right. Yes. <laughs> so, um, the, um, um, yes, I, 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 intuitively, I think maybe, uh, I, I, maybe we uh, do receive these, maybe they're weak quantum, you know, informatic transmissions, you know, again, I, it's hard to know what this kind of... Um, yeah, what, what's very clear is the more we understand about the mind and about the universe, mm -hmm. the more we understand how incredibly ignorant we are with our human brains. And if, if you look at, not necessarily an AXE or a perfect Slamanov induction machine, but even, even an AGI based on like open cog, 2.0 or 3.0, which is a dozen times more intelligent than human beings. Like how, how much more will it understand about logic that is dark to humans, but maybe quite illuminated to, to this, this, this type of super, super human mind. Right. So, I mean, yeah. we're, we're, this is why, uh, I know, keep I an open that, mind, you know, yeah, keep I opening. Mean, Jim, Jim, Jim Rutt, a good friend of mine who you also know, likes to say humans are about the, minimal possible generally intelligent system like we're just barely generally intelligent enough to fully realize how stupid we are and to work on building something more intelligent than us that can can more fully understand the the, the rest the rest of the world and then what, what's fascinating to me in this dialogue though is that you're you're very open-minded to transhuman forms of intelligence and the persistence of of patterns that are incomprehensible to humans as as beneficial because you're looking at pattern appreciation as, as as the core ethical principle but yet in your career you've been centrally focused on specifically human patterns and human face and, and, and human human emotional interactions in spite well, of having this i also created some some spooky spider art robots that would that would like reach yeah. out towards you with the long spindly fingers when you walk through an art gallery and but but they're just not as popular i don't know why <laughs> i remember those but yeah i mean i think what what's beautiful about the combination that you're describing is you're looking toward a you know a, a transhuman aspect of reality where there's patterns evolving and, and being appreciated by other patterns you know, of a complexity and variety beyond the human, but you're yeah. building robots, which it's been my, my honor to be involved with supplying some of the AI for. I mean, you're building robots that are able to sort of bridge the gap between the limited but beautiful domain of human patterns and the transhuman domain of broader patterns that 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 we're building. And the, I mean, this is the the wisdom of of. Sophia, at least in, in, in concept and, and, and what we're trying to make her. It's really the, the bridge between the human intelligence and human body realm and the, the transhuman pattern appreciation in, intelligence realm. And it's, it's amazing to be alive That's at the, the time when we're, we're building that bridge so actively. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, and, yeah. It's, it's, it's a great joy. And, and, uh, um, uh, 
uh, more more to um, you know some some of the questions that were that were asked um, uh, in in the uh, in the questions um, uh, about you know how likely it is, is it that we're contacted by this super intelligence um, the public access to the Philip K Dick so we can evolve um, together uh, and um, uh, you know what do psychedelics tell us about the consciousness. Um, <laughs> about consciousness. Well, I mean, I think that we all have psychedelic experiences every single night when we dream and often fiction take us into psychedelic um, uh, worlds and the chemicals at play uh, are analogs to naturally occurring chemicals in the brain within, you know, synthetic psychedelics and natural occurring psychedelics. So we have naturally occurring psychedelic brains. And I think that a lot of what civilization does and the waking mind does is actually filter the natural psychedelic or dreamer uh, mind that we that we experience i i feel um that like as a kid i had these uh, uh like um experiences that really drove me and it, w it was um uh, uh, a, a, an intuition that AI was going to be the most important technology in history as a as a child i felt uh, I, it seemed to me like um, that that was the answer, the way, if we could create, you know, machines that would reinvent themselves, they'd be able to solve any problem in, in the world. And then it occurred to me, how did I come to that logical conclusion? And I started expressing it to other people and it was befuddling to other people. <laughs> I later found that, that other people thought uh, there were people people out there who had the same conclusion and met them like you and many other folks and read about IJ Good and many other um, thinkers who, who were thinking along the same lines. But how does that um, occurrence, I mean, uh, so, so 5,000 years ago, it would have been difficult to think about it in that way. So this idea of, of emerging thoughts from popping up at the right time, the zeitgeist, um, you know, um, the the and the um, the mind becoming um, primed effectively, um, but uh, uh, at the same time, I felt uh, when I read Philip K. Dick's Vallis that that it was so true. There were so many aspects of it that rang so true to my personal experience. It's um, so I I I don't. I don't know what part of it is like just inspiring nonsense uh, versus uh, terrifying um, yet to be discovered, fully discovered truths. I, I don't, I'm not sure, but I think uh, that being open to the world of possibilities is key and training AI to be benevolently open to all the possibilities and help us to open our minds to the world of possible futures. Um, uh, can be extremely beneficial. This gets back to the concept of ethics. So often ethics are about proscriptions or limitations, what you don't do, what you can, what you're allowed to do and this kind of thing. But here is a different ethic. It is the ethic of creativity, the ethic of liberating your mind to the unknown, of of journeying into the unknown and coming back with something that has not yet been discovered. Um, maybe the others have discovered, but you have to go through that void um, uh, of the unknown. So um, that is something that is uh, really resonant with, uh, with a lot of the experiences described by the, you know, sort of shamans or mystics and, by creative people mm -hmm. in the world of arts, by and what um, we're after is it we want an AGI that can have that experience. We need the we AGI the... itself to go through the void of the unknown and discover radically novel things that it was it was unprepared for in its history, and that's going to be fundamentally yeah. different than a system that just recognizes the proximal patterns in in the data that it's perceived. That's it's right. more of a focus on radical pattern creation yes exactly creation. so um so we so maybe what we need to do is feed our ai psychedelics is that what you're saying <laughs> I, I i tried that it no no park in my laptop I mean, it's a shame <laughs> <laughs> well you don't just 
pour the oh, the stuff it's into just the a wa- it, it, it was a waste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, no. Uh, I, but again, I think that the dreaming state is naturally psychedelic, and when you get into a creative flow, it is naturally psychedelic. It's not about like synthetic substances. So how do you what 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 are the bioinformatics of the dreamer experience? And um, so it's beyond well, and, and I think uh, this, hits this on, session to answer that. This hits on important points, even apart from biology in terms of a- AGI design, because I mean, if you have an AGI system, a proto AGI system that's doing nothing but placing ads on web pages or rigorously trying to optimize a certain computable reward function, there may not be room in that AGI's dynamics for dreaming and creativity and, and radical imagination. Sure. And th- this actually leads on to the topic of the next panel we'll have a little later today, which is on, on open-ended, open-ended intelligence and sort of broader ways of conceptualizing what intelligence is. And I think that's, that's gonna be key to get to fully human level AGI and, and beyond, to leave room mm-hmm. in the AGI's architecture and processing time for dreaming, imagination, and and playing and creative cross pollination of things without without an immediate aim aim in mind. But then, amazing things may pop out of that that achieve your aims better than you imagined was possible. Yeah, and and I would say uh, creating. Uh, um, AI that brings out in people as well, yeah. and uh, having tools, uh, AI tools that that facilitate that kind of creative exploration with the directions of the technology and the underlying scientific inquiry uh, of the technology. I um, that that sort of creative process um, seems seems so important across all these um, different areas of. AGI research. So. And yeah, yeah, the tools you're making at Hanson Robotics are, you know, these are just about the the best technologies that I can imagine to facilitate this sort of creative inspiration in in humans as as well Maybe. as to sort of mine Maybe. some of the human creativity into the the AGI's mind. So yeah, this is a well, this has been a fantastic I, I, fantastic I conversation. I think we're we're going to have to we're slightly over time. We're going to have to wrap up and move move on sure. to the next thing. But I, we've probably kept you awake uh, longer than is 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 humane <laughs> to do. Anyway, we we need to let you diverge into the dreaming state of creativity. Huh? Woohoo! All right, or di- diverge so further much. into it. You may, you may be there already. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all but so yeah, much. Th- 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 thank you, thanks, so, thanks so much.